Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. My name is John Cameron. I'm your guest moderator for this evening. You can tell I'm the guest moderator because I'm much shorter and have less hair than Richard Fields, who's usually in this chair. Um, I work for Pacific Legal Foundation uh, as a development officer, which is a euphemism for fundraiser. Our reason we call ourselves development officers is so that people won't actually, uh, they'll let us in the door. If it was fundraiser, they wouldn't let us anywhere near there. So uh, on the show tonight, I have two very interesting and also first-time guests, well, second time because we taped the show, um, Taylor Moritz from uh, Capital Morning Report, who has also worked for Howard Jarvis. What did you do for Howard Jarvis? Uh, communications work. So basically trying to translate legal talk into talk journalists can understand. Oh. <laughs> Speaking of legal talk, we have uh, Robbie Fountain, who's... Uh, and I want to look at this because we used to call them one thing and now we call them another. Uh, Robbie does case development for Pacific Legal Foundation. Robbie is a um, graduate of Harvard Law School, which uh, lets you know the quality of folks that Pacific Legal Foundation is attracting. Um. I think <laughs> you probably could have got a job just about anywhere you wanted to. Mm -hmm. No? No? Yeah. yeah I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking. I don't yeah. care. He doesn't care. I don't he's care. here. He's here. Uh, he's what well, here? He's at Pacific Legal Foundation because he loves fighting for freedom, and we're on this show. I'm on this show as a, as a, a, a moderator, and our guests are here because we love the idea of freedom and self-determination, which is what libertarianism is all about, um, self-accountability and uh, loss of the nanny state. And speaking of the nanny state and its, uh, its ability to influence uh, media, we're going to talk about uh, what Taylor has affectionately told me she calls mainstream media, and that's lamestream media, <laughs> and their bias. And, and one of the stories that, that we're going to lead with is uh, uh, an NPR story that uh, talked about the top-heavy Trump staff. And, and you would think from a headline reading, top-heavy Trump staff, that, mm -hmm. that the Trump staff uh, at the White House that he's spending a huge amount of money and way more than the Obama administration. But it turns out that what he is running is a leaner staff, like 100 fewer people, 300 something versus 400, and spending 10% less. Yet the NPR story, the lead story said, um, Trump's top heavy staff. And so let's uh, have Taylor open and talk about uh, this particular headline and lamestream media bias and some examples. And Robbie, feel free to jump in. Yeah, I mean, wowie zowie, did that story get regurgitated through so many different um, outlets? And it's like just what you said, you read it and you thought, wow, this, there has to be some irresponsible spending going on in the Trump administration. But then when you actually go through the article, um, it doesn't place the most important information at the top. It starts off with maybe there's not um, very many qualified people that want to work in the Trump administration, mm -hmm. and, and they just cherry-picked a bunch of facts. Uh, but at the end of the day, Trump is spending 10% less than Obama mm -hmm. is on uh, and, paying his administration. So, and you know, we're going to talk about other, I think we all have examples of the lamestream media bias, but what was, as Taylor brought up mm -hmm. in the story, it was cherry-picking facts. The, their so-called uh, experts weighed in and said, <laughs> yeah. oh, no yeah. way, no way that, that uh, these, they're going to be able to get it done with only 357 people. You need the 450 people that, that uh, President Obama had on staff. That, that's, that's the reason nobody wants to work for Trump because they're so overworked. And I'm thinking, I worked in the fields when I was a youth. These, these mm -hmm. people don't even know what work is compared to normal The people. one quote that got me that I was like, well, this was unnecessary, was what the, the professor they quoted in the article saying like, oh, this indicates there must be like a lack of talent wanting to sign up for jobs. Yeah, that's you know what, what it was, about? the lack of that, talent. I was like, oh, there's, this, there's some clear bias. Like, yeah, it was very or, snide. Or so, wait, who's, in his, who's in his staff? Uh, uh, there are people working for peanuts that were making millions mm. in government sector. That's what I call Goldman Sachs. There are, are high-level academics with impeccable uh, backgrounds. There are people who've worked in media at, at, in, in very important positions for, for years. So, you know, what, what the, this, this professor's opinion uh, was professor. given, single professor was given very, very heavy weight, but buried, as Taylor yeah. said in the bottom of the story, was the most important thing. 
getting the job done with less people, which is what Trump said he was going to do. And I'm not a big fan, by the way. Um, mm. And spending less money, which is what he said he was going to do. But nowhere was that anywhere in the headline. You had to pull that out. And, and as a, you're, you're a journalist. A journalist's job is to explain the facts to the reader. Who, what, when, where, hi, who, what, when, where, how, and why, or whatever in the heck it yeah. is. And, and that wasn't done. It's, so it's bad journalism and a bad story. It, so some other examples. Give it makes some other us examples. look bad. I think there was four quotes from that random professor they chose to uh, I think that's actually his name, Professor Random. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Professor Random, and then the other quote was from Sean Spicer, who, that makes sense that they took the quote from Sean Spicer, but uh, that didn't understand that. But we were talking earlier about um, that meme that went viral. It's more of a gif. Over in the internet weekend. Land. Yeah, over the weekend, where uh, Trump, back in the day before he was, um, you know, politically involved at all, he was on WWE. So you, you, in the beginning, they do those skits, and Trump runs out and tackles one of the guys who's part of the WWE. Um, it's actually, I think his uh, the small business administrator's uh, husband. Oh, <laughs> his small business minis- administrator's husband, as it so as it so happens. How yeah. funny! Yeah. But so, anyways, somebody on the internet, as they always do, they're always creative and come to save the day. Uh, <laughs> photoshopped on the CNN logo on to the guy that Trump tackled in this mm-hmm. WWE clip. So this thing went bananas on the internet. It's, it's funny. I mean, no matter if you're a Trump supporter or not, it's, it's just funny. It's internet land. Mm. Um, so what happened was, um, is uh, CNN kind of shook down the guy on the internet who made the meme <coughs> and uh, basically said that they wouldn't reveal his identity so long as, you know, it was it was clear that he apologized for it. So it was this very strange, like, we're protecting ourselves. We're like morality police, too. Exactly. If you don't say anything else bad, like mm-hmm. in Reddit or whatever, because I guess they had done an investigation of his Reddit profile, which I think was, like, called Han Asshole Solo or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it basically, so Are CNN is suddenly, the the, suddenly yeah, CNN doing, is the arbiters of morality. See, yeah. wait a second. Clinton News Network is That's the what my parents called it back of, in the 90s, right? Of, of reality. <laughs> or yeah. fraud, hashtag yeah. fraud news. I yeah. don't know. Fraud News Network, <laughs> I think, was in the corner of the meme. I, th- I think it's just so embarrassing for the media to take these internet memes, which our generation, millennials, we understand the internet. We understand the internet's unforgiving. We understand that you don't put things on the internet that you don't want to be regurgitated Mm. in however way they will be because you can copy paste anything and change Mm. it we understand that but the older media establishment thinks that this random user on reddit is newsworthy so it just makes the media look certainly it almost makes certainly made them newsworthy well and they don't realize exactly right and And made themselves laughing stocks in the (laughs) to to, the whole to uh, to everyone who doesn't to everyone who uh, doesn't agree with them right Mm -hmm. yeah um but yeah, no. What they don't also don't realize is that you know uh, this this kind of focus on these sorts of stories is if if they are partisan as as they are to be believed to be. Um, well, they could have been focusing on the Republicans' failure to you know get health care reform through, but instead they're spending the whole last five or six days on Trump's trolling of the media. And mm-hmm. I and I you know you have to wonder if it's intentional on Trump's part. Um, the strategy of finding a uh, an op- opponent. Let's talk about that. I think that um, I am um, I am starting to be of the opinion that that uh, Trump is crazy like a fox. You are that um, it, not completely. I think he's also crazy like a crazy. But um, <laughs> I I think he does a really good job of leading the media around by their nose. Mm-hmm. And uh, he you know they say they need to take his Twitter account away from him, but He'll lead them away from whatever he's doing and in the background get some stuff done. Now, some of the stuff, like having Scott Pruitt eliminate all of these people who were were handing out billions of dollars of government money to left-wing radical uh, environmental groups through the auspices of the EPA, wonderful, right? Cutting regulation using the Congressional Review Act, um, which Pacific Legal Foundation has ordered, wonderful. I mean, um, talking about uh, cutting corporate taxes so that we're competitive with other countries in the world and we don't have all sorts of U.S. companies taking their capital overseas to avoid our 
or horrible taxes that we have here. Wonderful. And then he's doing some crazy stuff. But he, <laughs> he does all of these things without really the eye of, of the media on him because he'll, he'll do something silly and we'll they'll focus him with on the that. 4 a.m. tweet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And they'll distract him with, with a, I don't know, a, a tweet about a Fabergé <laughs> egg or something. And they'll follow it around like children. You I know, mean, he's really the reality Pied Piper. TV. Yeah, yeah, you have true. to think like there's a reason why people are infatuated with the Kardashians. There's a reason why people were infatu- infatuated with Trump when he did The Apprentice. There is something about being an unapologetic <laughs> uh, tyrant that people are attracted to, and they're embarrassed to admit it. Because what's more entertaining is watching this Trump meme, and you know with. CNN superimposed over this guy's face as he gets tackled. And the predictable response. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the freak out. <laughs> it, the freak out is so attractive, and they don't even realize they're kind of cannibalizing themselves by freaking I, out. I think as they're watching viewers disappear, and yeah. advertisers disappear, they're starting to realize they're cannibalizing themselves. They're kind of starting yeah. to act like Trump in a lot of the ways, which I think is so ironic. Trump. Trump, no, Trump, Trump, our, our cultural leader of America. So, again, I, right I think the drain. <laughs> what, what's hilarious to me, if you would have told people 10 years ago, I have a time machine, and I've gone to the future, and the, the two people who would be representing their parties in the 2016 election would be Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Um, Nobody would have believed you. They would have maybe taken you down for a psyche valve, you know, and, and put you on some meds. And, and that's the state of America. So well, since we're talking about Trump and, and some of the things he does, whether this is a real thing or just a distracting thing, I have a, I have a, a feeling it's kind of a real thing. Um, there's a voter fraud investigation by the Trump administration, and it is being... Um, it is being portrayed in the lamestream media. I love it when you told me that. It's, I, it's a first, believe it or not, it's the first time I'd heard it. So really? yeah, really? when you shared it with me, so that told that tells you how old school and and out of it that I am, right? Sinus infection. That's why I'm, you know, I can't hear myself speak here. Um, so somehow, um, trying to find out if there is voter fraud, is somehow preventing people from voting. I would, I would think that on the surface of it, investigating any activity to see if there's fraud going on would, would make those people who participate in that, that activity feel better that whatever that activity was on the uh, up and up and on the above board. And so um, one of the things that got me thinking that there might indeed have been uh, voter fraud in a very important 2012 presidential election was um, the Gallup organization's poll and Gallup is the gold standard of polling. They basically invented scientific polling. Um, they've, they've done more to um, create quality polls than anybody. They have professionals, professionals doing it. And they analyze everything you can possibly analyze to make sure that their polling is done the best of all polling. And the day before the 2012 election, uh, Gallup had Romney ahead by 49% to 48% um, for uh, Obama. And this was among likely voters. But these likely voters were also registered voters. And the actual Obama um, result was uh, winning the popular vote by nearly 5 million votes. So I think there is widespread voter fraud, and you two, I think, disagree with me. Let's talk about it. It's it's not that I disagree that voter fraud exists. I would I wouldn't say that it's widespread. I think it's a lot more rare than Trump would like to believe. Um, or and, I'd like to believe. Or, or yeah, yeah, or you. Um, <laughs> uh, and you know, I think it's kind of just gotten out of hand. Um, the discussion that we've had, and or at least the narrative that's going through our media right now. Um, our media meaning lamestream media, or our media meaning real media? <laughs> well, lamestream, unfortunately, is mainstream, so yeah. Yeah, it is what it is. But uh, I don't think that Trump's claims are substantiated. Um, I don't really know what we can do to prevent this like widespread voter fraud. Um, I think it could just be another one of those cases where the government tries to step in to fix something and it becomes 
very complicated uh, and doesn't really produce the results that we want. So what would so. people be, I know people are talking about they're worried about once again giving the federal government information, you know, social security numbers and driver's license numbers and all the rest of that stuff. So what about the, the opposite side, the opposite argument, where people say, well, I have to present a driver's license if I want to buy alcohol. I have to present a driver's license when, when I'm you know, registering a car. I have to present ID when I'm doing all of these in, things that have not nearly the bearing upon my future, the health of my children, my, my physical security, how my taxes are spent. Um, yet I can just go down and claim that I'm whoever, don't have to prevent any, present any evidence of it, and I can vote in an election. What about, what about that? How do you, what do you, how well, do you respond to that? Uh, I don't know about that as a, for me personally existing because I was not allowed to vote in the 2016 election because I didn't get my ass in gear and get my relay race done to absentee ballot in Texas. So it's not very easy to vote in Texas by absentee. Well, Texas has you. Texas has uh, voter ID laws. So. That's right. Yeah. So now, um, now I think that you can separate the issue of whether or not it's prudent to require an identification for voting from the issue of whether or not it's prudent for the Trump administration to be implementing through executive order a commission to investigate voter, voter fraud, yeah. the latter of which I personally disagree with. I think Trump's uh, claim of three million voters is unsubstantiated at this point. Now, if there is some – now, if he really – I mean, I guess at this I, at this point, he's established this commission. States are resisting, but you know what? If this uh, does go through and it blows up in his face and it turns out to be a big lie, then that's on him. So, yeah. um, mm -hmm. but I also don't like the way in which it was uh, done by executive order. I think that sound it's a, a bit of a fiat, and uh, I think it also presents federalism issues because you have the uh, state laws basically controlling election, mm -hmm. the electoral mm -hmm. process, and now you're having the states coerced or um, kind of commandeered into uh, submitting all this information and there are privacy concerns presented by it as well that mm -hmm. I have an issue with. That's all separate from the issue of, of voter ID laws, mm -hmm. uh, which is you know something separate entirely. And mm -hmm. So what do you I, feel about that? Do you think that people should be required? to present some form of identification to identify well, themselves as a qualified voter? Because um, um, there are many states, and, and somebody told me about uh, a, a, um, an overlay. It, uh, it was states that required voter ID and states that did not versus blue versus red states. It turns out that, that states that voted for Hillary by and large do not um, require voter ID of any kind, and states that voted for Trump do. Yeah, but that could so, be a cor that's like you know correlation causation. Correlation type causation. Like so the, you think that's correlative rather than causative? People in blue states are less likely to like want voter ID laws than people in red states are. Yeah. So then mm -hmm. I mean the politics would just shake out that way. I think okay. um, it should be a state. Maybe it's a, the best solution to the issue. It should be a state level issue. If we are, I mean, we are a federal republic, and so. Um, if Texas wants to have a strict voter ID law, then Texas can. If uh, and, and other states can enact their their voter ID laws. Now the courts, you know, are stepping in. There are cases out of North Carolina involving its voter ID law. Um, I believe that. I think Texas's law might have been challenged as well. Um, but uh, and until con Congress could always act and make this uh, make a uh, make make voter ID required, but we know how Congress works mm. in, in that mm -hmm. it, it doesn't really work. Mm. So there's nothing stopping Congress from requiring voter ID. Okay. They just haven't done it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we might have we might have beat that to death. Although we could probably pull it apart, put it back together again, ten or twelve more times. Let's move on to something else, uh, completely different. Yeah, you you mentioned Congress. Uh, folks in Congress work for the federal government, um, and their pay and benefit package is rather exciting. Uh, <laughs> if you're if you're employed by them, if you're a staffer, um, and uh, there there are a number of studies that indicate that uh, public sector pay and benefits at every level of education, a uh, person who works in the public se sector um, has higher pay and benefits uh, than person working in the private sector. And in the state of California, this disparity is even worse, except for the people at the PhD level. And where the disparity is really huge is that people at the lower end of the economic spectrum, 
high school graduates, non-high school graduates, some college, those folks in federal